what happened between you and Harvard? Well, I don't think they were quite happy with me when I was outspoken against the lockdowns uh, and school closures and instead favoring uh, uh, focused protection, doing better protection of all the people who are at the high risk. Uh, and uh, when uh, I, I had COVID, uh, I was hospitalized for it and uh, I have an autoimmune disease. So there was no need for me to get the vaccine, uh, nor would I protect others by taking the vaccine. Uh, so uh, they didn't like that either. So they said goodbye. So was you, you mentioned you had an autoimmune disease? Was that part of your reason for not wanting to follow up with a vaccine after your infection? It's not an autoimmune disease; it's an immune deficiency. Yeah, so it's called oh, alpha okay. one antigen deficiency, which makes me mm-hmm. sensitive to infections. Since as, it's a, any other genetic thing, so. Okay. Um, I, I reached out to, so I just, to, I was trying to understand the dynamics of Harvard and correct me if I'm wrong, but you were working at Mass Brigham Hospital, which is affiliated with Harvard. And they seem to be the ones who have the vaccine requirement. And I emailed them to ask, you know, first of all, to confirm, like, were you all the ones that fired Martin Koldorf? And if so, would you hire him back now that, you know, COVID is, you know, pe- people have had access to the vaccine for years now? Um, and yes, they confirmed that uh, your employment at Mass General Brigham was terminated. Um and that faculty positions at the medical school are contingent upon employment at Harvard affiliated at a Harvard affiliated academic medical center. Um, and then that there's a continuing primary series requirement, which affects new hi- hires. It amounts to receiving the latest COVID vaccine. If the new hire has not received a COVID vaccine in the past. So I guess the bottom line here is that, If you're uh, an undergraduate or a faculty member at Harvard, you don't have to get the vaccine, but there's a kind of special situation here for people affiliated with the medical program. Is there anything else you can add to that understanding? Uh, Yeah, so that was partly news to me, but uh, uh, that they still have that requirement. Uh, But it's very unscientific because having recovered from uh, COVID, I have better immunity against COVID than people who just had the vaccine. Right. Uh, well, why, uh, yeah, why, go ahead, would it, why would it still be in place in April 2024? It's not clear to me what the point is, given that we're at a point where pretty much everybody has had COVID. Uh, I agree with that question, and I don't have an answer to it, because I don't think there's a good answer to it. But I mean, in your scientific and medical understanding, you know, is there any steel man case for why they're requiring this? Or is it just entirely, you know, because they always have. And so they're digging their heels in and, you know, continuing to force people to get this vaccine when in reality, there's not much utility. Yeah, so there's no scientific reason for it or public health reasons or patient safety reasons to have this mandate in place. Uh, So it's probably inertia or unwillingness to uh, admit that uh, the vaccine mandates were both unscientific and unethical to begin with. And I say they are unscientific because uh, we've known since 430 BC during the Athenian plague two and a half thousand years ago, that if you have recovered from an infectious disease, you have immunity. Sometimes it's permanent immunity for a lifetime, like these cells, and sometimes it just protects you from severity of disease the next time you get infected, which is the case for coronaviruses, including the four previous ones. So uh, there's no, uh, and we know, we knew very early on in 2020 that if you had COVID, you had uh, immunity that protected you from uh, for, uh, later. You can still get it again, as with other coronaviruses, but you're still protected. So it's not scientific for that reason, but it's also very unethical because uh, let's, for the sake of argument, assume that this is the best vaccine ever. Uh, 100% efficacy, it doesn't have that, but let's just assume it and no side effects. There are side effects, but let's assume it's just the perfect thing. Then uh, with COVID, there's more than a thousand for difference in mortality among the old and the young. So to force people 
that are young or to force people who have already had COVID, who have immunity, to get the vaccine when there are a lot of people, including my 87-year-old neighbor, who hadn't gotten the vaccine. That's very unethical because you're deprived, there was a shortage of vaccines. You're depriving the vaccine from people who need it and who benefit from it by forcing mandate to people who don't need it. So it's very unethical and very bad public health policy to have these mandates on people that don't need a vaccine when there are people uh, out there that haven't gotten it, but do, who do need it because they're at very high risk. Yeah, so I, I think want... that what, Brigham, what Harvard's National Brigham and Harvard University did by this mandate was highly unethical uh, uh, and very bad for public health. A great example of that, you know, is the vaccination of children. I'm still struck by how to this day, as a New York City parent, when I take my toddler to the pediatrician, there's frequently the suggestion that he gets a COVID vaccine and the implication that this is very, very important. And I wonder for parents who were receiving this pressure from the city of New York during peak pandemic, um, when the vaccine was beginning to be rolled out, it doesn't really make sense to be vaccinating a one and a half year old boy compared to, you know, my elderly in-laws. Um, that was always a component to this that's sort of bizarre when we know, in fact, that thankfully, this is not particularly dangerous to children or rather the, va the, the, the virus itself is not particularly dangerous to children. The vaccine certainly carries some risk for, you know, boys of, of a certain age. You're 100% right. So when you look at any vaccine or any drug for that matter, you have to look at the benefits and the potential risks. So for all the people who have a high risk of dying from COVID back in 2021, uh, if they hadn't had COVID already, uh, they maybe had a 1% risk of dying. And then even if there's a small risk from the vaccine, it's still worth taking it because the benefits uh, outweigh the risks. Mm -hmm. But for children or young adults, we know that the risk of dying from COVID is minuscule. So, uh, and it's less than the, than the average influenza year during the last decades, where usually about 200 to 1,000 kids every year die from influenza, depending on the severity. So COVID has less risk than the typical historical influenza season. Mm. And then to give a, a vaccine to a child with very minuscule risk, so you know the benefit is very, very small at best, mm -hmm. but you don't know what the risks are. Uh, now we know it because we know that the risk of, for example, myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart, mm -hmm. uh, especially among uh, teenage uh, boys and young men. Uh, so uh, we know there are some risks. So I don't think I don't think people, children should get this vaccine. Uh, and I think also basically forcing this vaccine or trying to force it on people just make parents skeptical about the other vaccines like measles, which is actually a very important vaccine. I want to uh, back up for a second, uh, and then I want to return to what we know and don't know about vaccines at this point. But um, I want to, you know, n now there's a little bit, there, there feels like a little more breathing room to talk about these issues. People aren't quite as heated as they were maybe two or three years ago. Uh, first of all, when, when did your... Um, relationship with Harvard, when was that severed? Uh, what, what's the timeline here? So uh, uh, Harvard's National Brigham fired me uh, a little bit two years ago. Okay. And it's then Harvard Medical School put me on leave for two years. Wow. And then uh, they uh, ended that leave uh, at the end of last year. Okay. So we're talking about uh, 2022. What was it like, you know, p people have a certain perception of Harvard and what the culture of Harvard is like. What was it like for you at that time uh, being a sort of dissident uh, among the Harvard faculty? Like, wh what was that experience like in 2022? So, so among my colleagues that I work with, like on a regular basis, uh, doing research with, I had no problems. I would say the majority of them were in favor of focus protection and were skeptical school closures and stuff like that. So I had absolutely no problems with any of the people I work with on a regular basis. Uh, the leaderships of Harvard's Mass General Brigham did not like, for example, when I 
uh, did interviews with uh, about the Great Barrington Declaration. So they were they were not so happy, and there were others mm -hmm. who were also unhappy. Uh, when two of my colleagues tried to arrange, this was in 2020, uh, late 2020, they tried to arrange like a debate between me and some of my colleagues who were in favor of school closures and lockdowns. Uh, so two of them tried to arrange a debate, but there was no takers on the other side. So I said yes, of course. But Wait, there, there were no not... takers on the other side? No, they didn't want to debate me. But was they the, were making that like law a... the land. I don't understand how you could possibly, you know, force a policy into place and then not feel comfortable defending it in a public forum. Yeah, to me, that's kind of shocking. Yeah. And when people wonder who they should trust when it comes to public health, I think one criteria is if if some if there's a scientist who's not willing to debate other scientists about it, then you shouldn't trust them. Hey. Thanks for watching that clip from our show, Just Asking Questions. You can watch another clip here or the full episode here. And please subscribe to Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed for notifications when we post new episodes every Thursday.